Okay, so let's just, we're making a very leisurely start. I'm sorry, it's really always like this at the beginning of a course, a little bit boring where you, you have to talk about the mechanics of the course, the housekeeping of everything. Um, but it won't really be like that for the, for the rest of the, of the course. So all, all I want to do today, briefly in the time we have, available is just to give you a, like a trailer you know looking ahead of what we're going to cover some very brief sense of uh, some of the topics that we might deal with so the first thing we'll look at will be abstract expressionism first sort of important post-war art movement and probably the most well-known artists of the abstract expressionist movement and someone we'll look at in Quite, quite a bit of depth really is Jackson Pollock this is his autumn rhythm <coughs> of 1950 uh, one of the uh, funny things in a way about art since 1945 is often you don't really have a very strong sense of agreement amongst people about who the great artists are you know when you get back to earlier periods in art history it's usually pretty clear who are the important ones um, you might even say Jackson Pollock is just about the last artist that everyone kind of agrees is, an, is you know, is important. You know, uh, although they may have different reasons for why they think he's important. When you get to someone like Andy Warhol, he's a very prominent figure, but you'll find some people say, "Oh, Andy Warhol, that's rubbish." You know, it's it's, it's actually kind of already very kind of controversial. Um, yeah sense about reputation. So Jackson Pollock is particularly well known for pouring paint. His, his method, his technique is so distinctive or so personal, so tied to him that his art looks so so different. He's the guy who works with his canvas on the ground <coughs> and pours paint rather than using a brush. Very distinctive signature style that makes his work stand out and Therefore, in a funny way, although he's incredibly influential as an artist, he had few direct followers because it's quite hard to follow without imitating. Uh, you know, it's like you'd have to imitate someone's voice or something like that. It would sound strange. The most significant art movement in Europe in the pre-war period, the late pre-war period, would have been Surrealism. Actually some of the Surrealists went to America and Surrealism was really influential in America during the wartime period and, and immediately afterwards. And it was important for Jackson Pollock. So a big route for his art is Surrealism and its interest in the unconscious. So he's, he's working in a very spontaneous way because he wants art that can directly express his unconscious processes, not something very conceptual. It's very much from the gut. So surrealism is very important roots. You know, surrealism, surrealists are often involve very fast methods of working. The idea is that way you can bypass the censorship of the conscious mind, automatism. So that's part of the root of what we're seeing here. Another equally important influence on Jackson Pollock was Picasso, the most important European artist, the most famous European artist of the first half of the 20th century. And to many of these Americans, he was like a, a kind of giant. And if you look at as we will do, look at some of the early work of Jackson Pollock, you'll see him really sort of struggling uh, to, to come to terms with Picasso. Uh, so a funny thing happens is that often for these abstract expressionists, their breakthrough is to, uh, almost to a complete new beginning. You know, it's something to do with how to move beyond the work of great masters that seem to be towering over you how to kind of start from zero you've really got to break things down to find a new beginning there's an engagement with surrealism engagement with picasso but also you know it's partly tied up with this 
very individual way of making images, starting in a, in a, in a completely new way. We'll see with other abstract expressions the same thing. Something about uh, the task of face of trying to create modern art in a country that didn't, you know, there were modern American artists, but they weren't particularly, they weren't the famous ones, you know. There were modern artists all over the place. There were modern artists in Mexico, actually. They were more famous than the American ones. Jackson Pollock was amongst those American artists who looked to the Mexicans for inspiration. So all this kind of big flowering of American art uh, in the post-war period, it came from relatively shallow roots, and it came from an engagement with something European, but twisting those um, European sources into something distinctively new in a new cultural environment. It's abstract art, so much of that work was abstract. Uh, the, uh, the first few weeks of the course we'll be looking almost entirely at abstract art and yet its roots were art that w wasn't particularly abstract like Picasso never made abstract art. Much of surrealism is tied up with images. So it's abstract art that doesn't really have a continuity with European abstract artists, artists like Kandinsky or Mondrian were not of interest to Pollock or indeed any of the abstract expressionists really uh, in a deep way. So it's a kind of new flowering of abstract art but from different roots. It's not a continuity with earlier European abstract art. I'll say much more later when we look at him. So uh, another side of abstract expressionism is marked by the work of Rothko, Mark Rothko. Um, one side, in, like Jackson Pollock's work, is work that is um, gestural, mark, spontaneous mark making, linear touch, individual touches. Uh, another side is what you could call colour field painting. That's artists like Rothko or Barnett Newman, Clifford Still. Colour is the main means of his art. Almost everything else has been reduced, eliminated from uh, the image. I suppose what the two sides of abstract expressionism have in common is that they, they all make art very reductive, very simple. There's just one thing going on. You, you take in the whole canvas at one go. Okay, there are some shapes within it, but they're not really sort of compose one against another you know it's not a kind of jigsaw puzzle interlocking shapes like you get in cubism most cubist paintings are kind of have a sort of more like an architectural structure one thing built up against another there's nothing like that here the, the structure is so simple you see the whole before you see the parts i would say that's true with too. You have this sort of all over feel. The same kind of marks are found in different parts of the image. It's not, uh, it's not made up of parts that become a whole. Somehow it's, it's a whole already. Unity is very important. A rhythmic unity in Pollock's case. A sort of feel like unity in Rothko's case. Maybe the subject matter is still there. There's not many things to look at, but the subject matter, just because there are not objects in the painting doesn't mean it's not about something. It could be about feelings, emotions, maybe even quite you know, primal emotions, sort of deep emotions, you know, ecstasy. It's a kind of religious art, almost, in a sense. It's dealing with very rich human experiences. That's the, the transcendental, the sublime. Getting rid of the trivial. Frank Stella, J. 
Jasper's Dilemma, 1962 to 3. So, yeah, as you see abstract art in the States developing <coughs> through the 1950s, through the 1960s, in the wake of abstract expressionism, I'm jumping ahead pretty quickly here, um, you still see that same simplicity. You know, it's like the idea is already complete. Uh, there isn't, it isn't sort of built up of parts that make a whole. It's just declared as a whole right from the start. Bam! You know, it's not, there's nothing to, 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 to work out. So this is the kind of art that often people refer to when they try to tell a story that, oh, art was becoming more and more pure or more formalistic, getting rid of subject matter even more uh, in a more extreme way. It kind of fits this kind of art, but it, uh, maybe it's a misconstruing of what someone like Rothko is trying to do. Frank Steller would say things like, what you see is what you see. You know, there is nothing, there's nothing there except what is visually there. There's, there's nothing that you can, that you can't understand, you know, often with this sort of art people say oh it's all so deep and mysterious I'm not sure I quite get it well don't worry Frank Stella would be saying you know it's all there if, if it's not there it's, it's, it's there's nothing hidden away underneath so, so they're sort of getting rid of all that kind of sublimity and the concern with the transcendental mythic quality but keeping some of the formal qualities of abstract expressionism. And then art that, that kind of wants to defile that sense of purity, bringing images back in a very big way, pop art. Not just any old images too, but images from popular culture, from everyday life bringing something low into the world of high art, mass reproduced comic book images, and, you know, into a world like that of Rothko dealing with, you know, refined, sublime emotions. This is like, you know, a little sentimental, everyday kind of trashy kind of uh, uh, emotions, you know. It's sort of dealing with the big issue as well, death, but in a slightly kind of trivialized way. Uh, one thing you could say is going on here is art trying to find a purpose for itself in a world where, you know, which is full of mass reproduced images. What kind of role is there left for a handmade image? in a world which is saturated with mass reproduced images, photographs, printed images of different kinds, in this case comic book images. Well, one possible answer to that question is that art can be a place where you can comment upon all those mass reproduced images that surround us, with, you know, within which we live every day now. So different, say, from the 16th century, you know, how many images were there in the 16th century that you would throw away, for instance, you know, you wouldn't see images on the MTR on your way to work, you know, advertising all different things, you wouldn't see images on a TV screen, you wouldn't see images in a newspaper, etc, etc. So we live in this kind of image saturated world, maybe art can be a space where we come to try to form some opinions about that world we're living in. We, we freeze it so that we can start to think about it. The funny thing about a lot of pop art though is it, it doesn't want to take a very clear-cut position. It isn't saying popular culture is bad, ha ha ha, let's make fun of it or something like that. And it isn't just straightforwardly endorsing popular culture either and saying all oh, this is wonderful. It's, it, it's the very indifference, in a way, that is the kind of slightly unsettling thing. Yeah? Do you know if there is more than one reproduction of this piece? 
because I actually saw this piece earlier this summer yeah. at the FOMA, and I'm looking at a picture I took of it. Yeah. And um, there's actually more color and more detail in the waves and the, her skin. Um, I don't know where this image is from exactly, or if it's just one. Yeah, what, what, what is the version you have that you Yeah, yeah. Um, it can be that there are slightly, slightly different versions. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes. But I mean, one thing to bear in mind is um, projected images are always not going to be as good as the real thing. They're never going to be as good, even as images on a screen, and they're not going to be as good as the real thing. Um, up until last year, I actually used to continue to use old-fashioned slides. Oh, yeah. uh, I was the only person who ever did that uh, because it's almost like an antique medium. But the reason I did it is for, for modern and contemporary art, colour matters and colour is, is distorted. Often you have students when they make their presentations, they'll, they'll, that's when they'll notice that the projected image is not the same as on their, their screen. Actually, it's a f art history is dependent upon projection, projection images. We, our discipline came into existence when projecting of images became possible. But at the same time, it's a kind of limitation we work with. Everything comes up looking the same. Um, this is uh, it's the same size. Uh, that's already lost something because uh, abstract expressionism and all the art we're looking at so far beyond that is really large in scale. It kind of um, a Rothko painting, a Jackson Pollock painting, it absorbs your whole field of vision. Uh, and uh, that's really different from, say, looking at a Paul Clay painting or even a, a Picasso, most Picasso paintings. But when you look at it in an art history classroom, everything comes out exactly the same size. A little tiny sketch or a, a vast mural all come out the same. Um, we lose a sense of texture. So we need to be a bit aware of that. Or, you know, here's an image that's talking about using paint to, to talk about a medium of mass reproduction. But here we're looking at a, re a reproduction of that handmade image. So it's kind of, we've gone back to the, the very thing that it's trying to talk about. So. Yeah, we need to be a little bit careful about what we're doing, and we need to look at original images as much as we can. Andy Warhol, of course, the most famous name in uh, pop art, 25 Colored Marinins, Mar 1962. Again, uh, you know, you could say a big concern is about images and their power. Mass reproduction gives images power. It, it helps create fame. Marilyn Monroe becomes famous because so many people have seen her <coughs> films or seen her, you know, photos of her. And the process of, of repetition of the same image, even within one image, it talks about that process of mass reproduction. Shifting colors help to indicate the sense of images are sort of manufactured, the disparity between image and reality. How much a, 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 a persona is a sort of made up thing. You even sort of see as if we're looking at makeup, you know, as if something applied to the surface of the face or colored hair or something. It's all artificiality is kind of emphasized. Often the, the figures that he likes to focus on are people who have, um, you know, have died or something like that. So, you know, serious things come in. Death is still there as a theme in Andy Warhol's work. This is an example of how an artist from a, a later period could be mapped onto a story. If we're talking about pop art, we can talk about 
certain artists, you can call them loosely a post-pop artist, like Jeff Koons. He's alive and active working today. He is uh, one of his early sort of successes from 1986, his rabbit from 1986. So again, it's you know taking some mastery produced popular culture item, a ch child's toy, and then uh, making it in, in metal or getting craftsmen to do so for you. Very common theme now um, in, in art. So, so disparity between high and low. Cindy Sherman. Yeah, again, you can see her as an artist. She, you can't reimagine her to doing what she did if pop art hadn't been there in the first place. It's a, it's a sort of critical engagement with uh, a form of mass reproduced imagery. You know, we've seen these kind of images. It could be in films. It could be in comic books too. Uh, the woman's waiting at the phone for her her, her lover to call. <laughs> Actually, this is a dip from a different technological era, the era before mobile phones, where if you really wanted a phone call, uh, you had to be where there was a phone. I guess none of you have experienced this in your life of having to be in one place in order to be phoned, you know. Uh, but I, in my life, it overlaps with my life experience. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, she's she's getting to deal with certain stereotypes about how women are represented, a sort of the passive role of waiting for the man, active man, to, to, to make the decision, is he going to call her or not? Uh, and her approach is that she is always playing the role, you know, of, of the woman. So she's getting inside that stereotype and playing around with it from within, well, both inside and outside. She's behind the camera and behind, uh, uh, she's the actor in the, the scenario as well. So denaturing it from within, giving us a space to think a bit about it, how these stereotypes impinge on, on, on women's uh, identities. Wang Guangyi, good example of a Chinese artist who's also sort of mappable onto the story of pop art. It's really hard to imagine him without uh, without pop art. You know, even Ma Warhol played with the image of Mao. You know, one of the most reproduced images in the whole of human history, really. That little portrait of Mao that was in the Little Red Book. So Wang Guangyi putting together the old cultural revolution imagery with the new imagery of international consumer goods, McDonald's and the cultural revolution together, clash of old and new. And he's not telling you what to think about. He's not giving you an idea that one is better than the other. He's not saying, oh, well, we're, we're pro progressing. We've moved beyond all that bad old stuff and now we're, we're somewhere new. I mean the, the new is just a, as much about propaganda as the old, it's just a different capitalist propaganda. Uh, so it, it's it's the very deadpan way in which he's presenting it which is perhaps the kind of slightly unsettling thing about it all. And it's belonging to 1992 which is it's exactly the year really when the, the there was this transformation between uh, uh, with new uh, international consumer culture finally really being visible in the, the streets of China. You know, that, that was the year that the first McDonald's branch opened in, on Wang Fu Jing in Beijing, just the one in the whole country. So, uh, you know, it's, it, it's an image that belongs exactly to that moment where you see a strange clashing. You know, you, you, on one wall you can see a uh, communist slogan on another wall you see you know buy this fizzy drink or whatever you know this Pepsi or whatever it happens to be strange kind of mixing of different rhetorics well, that, now that that moment has gone 
uh, Carl Andre, you know, one of the minimalist artists, his lever of 1966. You know, it, this is an example of taking something and pushing it to its limits. You know, the the, the simplified, abstract language of art push so so simple that then it kind of breaks down from within just a series of bricks are arranged in a row it's so so formally simple that it's not of interest in itself so then <coughs> our attention shifts to the context so it becomes more a matter of we're looking at the whole room and how this intervention affects the the whole room so it's the beginning of installation art if you like when we're starting to look at the whole space art is working with the whole space or they can move out of doors Christo and Jean-Claude wrap, wrapping the Reichstag it's not so much about the cloth that they use it's about how that transforms uh, the, the whole environment Being his book from the sky, late 1980s. An intervention in the, the, the notion of the printed word using Chinese characters, but each one of those characters is not a real character. It has the form of a Chinese character, but it's unreadable. So it's a sort of dada gesture. all of Chinese culture is there it seems and yet you can't kind of grasp hold of it there's nothing you can make sense of so installation art conceptual art Dada all of these are kind of coming together in an interesting way one of the first installation art pieces in China and this is kind of one of the interesting sort of differences when you're dealing with living artists you know I mean Xu Bing is one of the artists I know I, I've met Christo I've corresponded with Andre uh, interviewed Wang Guang Yi you know it's a very different kind of relationship you can have to with living artists try you can actually try and dialogue with them um, that you you just can't uh, have the same approach with earlier areas of art history so very quickly, because we're running out of time. Um, well, example of conceptual art, Joseph Kosuth, titled Art as Idea as Idea, Meaning, 1967. Well, words instead of the visual, words replacing the visual, talking about how words influence the visual. Anti-retinal approaches to art, exactly the opposite of something like Frank Stella which is purely addressed to the eye. Here's something that wants to emphasize the mind. Manzoni, artist's breath, 1960. The artist's body coming in. Actually, so much of, uh, yeah, even with Jackson Pollock, there's a great concern with the artist's body. You know, you're aware of the traces of the, how he moved to create those marks. And that's the kind of theme that follows on. Even uh, Carl Andre working on the floor with his lever, it, it's kind of following on from the way Jackson Pollock worked on the floor. Uh, so the artist's body becomes a, a major kind of theme, not just representing bodies, but the body of the, the maker is also important. Eventually, the air disappears from the balloon well then Manzoni himself is gone too actually so it becomes a, a, a different kind of meaning process changing over time new technology of course is a factor with the way art has been changing uh, so video art for instance a whole new category yet in many ways we can still tie it back to what happened before the fact that Viola calls this the Nantz triptych he's used, deliberately using a term that refers back to the triple panels of early religious art 
So maybe some of the issues that it's concerned with are often really the, the, the same big issues, life and death. You know, it's a three screen video. On one screen, it shows you a baby being born. On the, the far screen, it shows someone on the verge of death. Actually, it's his own mother. And this was done around the time his own baby was born. And then in, in between, a, a, a figure sort of floating in underwater. Um, the return of figuration, of imagery, in the 1970s and 80s, this is a big theme, the return to a kind of expressionistic art for, for many. Um, Anton, Ke Anton Kiefer is one of the big names in that story. It's partly out of a desire to engage with his own country's history, Germans, Germany's tortuous 20th century history during the Nazi era, as something you can't just leave behind. Maybe it's okay for an American artist like Frank Stella to kind of make art that kind of cuts off from the past. But for a German artist like Kiefer, no, you, you, somehow the trace of history is something you've got to face up to. You can't, uh, can't, can't just sort of forget it. Or Lucien Freud, mm -hmm. British artist. Uh, it, and on one hand, it, it, it looks like a, a kind of realist painting that could have been made before the whole story of modernism. But at the same time, it's different because realism now we know is just one possible mode of image making. It's not, it, it doesn't have a sort of sense of being true. It's just one style. It's an available style, but you have to justify it as much as you have to justify abstract art. So we're living in this world of pluralities, and uh, this is one of the different options that's a, a, a available to you. So that, that's just a very quick overview of some of the things that we'll uh, be seeing in the weeks to come. Um, so I look forward to seeing you next week. And we'll, 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 we'll start looking at abstract expressionism at um, Gorky and Pollock. Briefly, we'll look at the artist Ashio, Ashio Gorky, and then we'll look at Jackson Pollock. We'll start looking at Jackson Pollock. So no meeting in the Friday slot, but then we'll, we'll meet um, uh, the same time next week, next Tuesday. Oh, and there's something I want to say. I, I'm having an exhibition. I should, I should have brought the information. I'm having an exhibition. Did you get uh, an email about this? There's a, uh, the opening is next Tuesday, so um, at the University Museum. Anyway, there should be a, some posters up. Just to let you know. So, if anyone has any questions or worries, please let me know, and uh, I'll I'm, I'll hang around a little bit after the lecture you can chat with me.